gotten rather excited over some of them. Amen. And I'm going to present a message on that. But Don said half of the people make resolutions. And only half of those keep them up to six months. So that you will not be disappointed on a New Year's message, I will give you one quick story. The young man called home. He's now out of the nest and he's on his own. And it's New Year's Day and he calls home. Dad answers the phone. Hello, Dad. Happy New Year. Dad, tell me, what's your New Year's resolution for this year? And he said, my resolution is that this year I want to make your mother the happiest woman all year long. Then mother got on the phone. Hello, Mom. Happy New Year. What's your New Year's resolution? My New Year's resolution is to help Dad keep his New Year's resolution. I wonder which one broke it first. <laughs> At any rate, that's about the way resolutions go. But we're not going to talk about New Year's resolutions anymore. We're going to be looking at God's Word. We want to know where we came from and how we got here. Are we the chance products of mindless evolution? Or are we here because God created us? Amen. When you put it that way, the issue is very stark. Did the universe just happen? Or was it caused? Did the human race rise up from the primordial ooze? Or were we intentionally created by the hand of God? Those questions are fundamental to our understanding of reality itself. If you believe that we evolved over billions of years, that we had nothing more than time plus chance plus a few helpful mutations that separate us from the shark and the cola bear and the porcupine and maybe even the skunk. If that's what we are and that's all we are, then you don't need God. Because the universe can take care of itself quite nicely without Him. But if you believe that every single man and woman is a creation of God, and that we are unique because God made us in His image, then you will have an entirely different view of the universe and your place in it. The stakes are very high. Say what you will about Genesis 1 through 11. But sooner or later, you will have to deal with it. Amen. This is where the Bible began, so we can't escape it or ignore it. Or pretend it isn't there. Now, it's only fair that I tell you right up front where I'm coming from. I accept the words of Genesis 1 through 11 as literal truth from God. Amen. As I read these chapters, I find them to be exalted and yet simple. No other writing in all human literature possesses the grandeur of these opening chapters of the Bible. There are many amazing things in Genesis 1 through 11. And they are all literally true. Because I believe they are all literally true, 
I reject outright the notion that these chapters are myths or legend or poetry. Read it and see for yourself. I do not think you'll come away saying this was meant to be a fairy tale. To the contrary, these chapters were meant to be taken as a true account of the origin of the human race. I should add that these chapters are the hottest battleground mm -hmm. in the Bible. For well over a hundred, almost, it's over a hundred and fifty years now, from the time of Charles Darwin until the present day, <coughs> unbelievers and skeptics, infidels and doubters of all varieties have leveled their rhetorical artillery in Genesis 1 through 11. They've attacked this section of God's Word from every possible angle. We are told again and again that science has proved that these chapters cannot possibly be true, that evolution must be accepted as fact, and that no intelligent person could ever actually believe in a literal Adam and Eve, Mercy. a literal serpent talking, a literal Garden of Eden, or a literal Cain and Abel, a literal Noah, a literal Ark, and certainly not a literal worldwide flood, much less a literal Tower of Babel. These things are nonsense, so we're told. Foolishness. The product of a pre-scientific era. And unfortunately, many well-meaning Christians have bought into these attacks to a significant degree. My library is full of some comments by these Christians that try to compromise. Because we are intimidated by the canopy of criticism that comes when we dare say, yes, we do believe this is how the world came to be. It's been easier for us to keep silent so we won't be mocked. Or to make a series of compromises so that we can live at peace with the unbelieving majority that largely controls the education in America and the media. There is no need to make any compromise with yeah. unbelievers. Yeah. It never works. It never helps. And they won't be convinced by our compromising anyway. If they're going to shoot at us, we might as well fight it out with our guns blazing. In her book on Genesis 1 through 11, it's called God's Story. Annie Graham Lotz, daughter of Billy Graham, makes much of the fact that Genesis is an eyewitness account. She points out that in a court of law, nothing is more valuable than an eyewitness who can relate exactly what he saw Amen. and heard. Every week, criminals are convicted on the testimony of eyewitnesses whose stories could not be impeached. Genesis is God's eyewitness testimony of the creation of the world, which is one reason why skeptics attack it so bitterly. Satan hates this portion of God's Word because of its message. Genesis 1 through 11 establishes that there is a God. Yeah. A God who reigns supreme over the universe. It tells us that God made us, that He established the rules for life and therefore we are totally accountable to Him. 
in a deep sense. The purpose of these chapters is to reveal God to us that we might come to know him personally. There are three questions we must all answer eventually. Where did I come from? Why am I here? And where am I going? You can never answer the last question until you answer the second. And you'll never answer the second question until you answer the first. Genesis tells us that we, that we came from God. And it also tells us why we are here. We were made by God. We were put on the earth to know God and to serve Him. And in serving Him we find meaning and purpose and fulfillment and incredible satisfaction and a self-worth. We were made for God, and the more we know about Him, the happier we will be. I invite Amen. you Amen. to open your Bibles to the very first verse of the Bible. <laughs> and with our Bibles open, shall we bow for prayer, our loving Father. With your word open, Lord, we pray for understanding. We pray that you'll open our hearts, open our minds to your will, your way, and your truth is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. As I study this verse, I'm struck by the fact that it's a declaration not an argument. Yeah. As far as I can tell, the Bible nowhere argues for the existence of God. The Bible simply declares that God is. And that He created all things. And once you get it settled in your heart that God is, a lot of other problems will be solved as well. Amen. I'd like to briefly suggest... Uh, Four implications of Genesis 1, verse 1. Number one, the universe had a definite beginning. Number two, the universe was created by God out of nothing. Number three, all things owe their existence to God, the Creator. Number four, True wisdom begins with Genesis 1, verse 1. Let's look at number 1. The text says, in the beginning, referring to the beginning of all created things. When the Jews named this book, they named it after the very first word of the Hebrew text, which literally means, in the beginning. or as the title, The Beginning. This is where everything starts. That fact helps us understand that matter is not eternal. There was a time when matter, as we know, it, it did not exist. The universe is not eternal. The things we see around us, the trees, the buildings, and the cars we drive, the things we own, the mountains and the ocean, none of it's been here forever. Only God is eternal. Everything else had a beginning. Even time itself was created by God. This world is God's house. He left clues everywhere about what kind of God he is. Now that raises a question that children like to ask him, and adults secretly wonder about, who created God? 
The answer is no one. He was there before the beginning. He had no beginning. He did not create himself. He was. He is. And he will always be. Amen. Now I admit that we cannot comprehend all that that means. But know this, God stretches back further than your mind can imagine. Amen. He goes far beyond the reaches of chemistry or biology or history or mathematics or quantum mechanics or speculations of theoretical cosmology. I use those big words because that's what the other people say. He dwells in eternity. Which means no telescope can find him. And no computer program can define him. When I was a child of 12, I attended the First Presbyterian Church in Fort Smith, Arkansas. We recited every Sunday the Apostles' Creed. And the Apostles' Creed begins with these simplistic, majestic words. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Ponder this thought. Genesis 1-1 tells us God created all that we see around us. He created the sun and the stars and the moon and the planets. He created the comets and the asteroids. He created the quasars and the pulsars and the black holes out in space. Scientists estimate that there are over 400 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy. Scientists estimate that there are more than 100 billion galaxies, each with at least 100 billion stars. Imagine that. God hung each one he hung each one in space Amen. and calls each one by name. For in Psalm 147, 4 we read, He determines the number of the stars and calls them each by name. No wonder the Bible says in the 19th Psalm, the heavens declare the glory of God, the sky above proclaims his handiwork. God has left his fingerprints all over the universe. You have to be blind not to see it. This world is God's house. He's left clues everywhere about what kind of God he is. When you stand at the Grand Canyon, you can't help but be overwhelmed at the mighty power of God to create such a magnificence. He must have had a big, mighty hand to scoop out the Royal Gorge in Colorado. He is as intimate as dark recesses of the mighty Atlantic Ocean. Each snowflake testifies to his uniqueness. The changing colors in the great smoky mountains proclaim his creativity. I've traveled this country all over. The beauties of his creation are not to be denied. Galaxies shout out, here he is, the, he is there. The wildflowers sing together, he is there. The rippling brooks join in, he's there. The birds sing it, the lions roar it, the fish ride it in the oceans. He is there. All creation joins to sing His praise. The heavens declare it. The earth repeats it, and the wind whispers it. He is there. Deep cries out to the deep. The mighty sequoia tells the eagle who soars overhead. The lamb and the wolf agree on this one thing. He 
He is there. No one can miss the message. God has left his fingerprints all over this world. Truly, this is my Father's world. Yeah. And every rock, every twig, every river, every mountain bears his signature. He signed his name to everything he made. The earth was marked, made by God, in letters so big, no one fails to see it. He created the heavens and the earth out of nothing. The technical term is ex nihilo. Amen. He spoke and the stars filled the sky. He spoke and the birds began to fly. He spoke and the fish began to swim. He spoke and roses began to bloom. He spoke and the snail began to crawl. The cow began to howl. The hummingbird began to hum. Hebrews 11.3 explains it this way. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the Word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. When God wanted a turtle, He said, Turtle be, and the turtle poked his head out of his shell for the very first On the basis of Genesis 1-1, we know these things are true. God is. God acts. God creates. He is sovereign. He is almighty. He is omnipotent. He is supreme. Yeah. Only God creates. Yeah. We don't create anything. We take existing material and fashion it into something new. We make things only God creates something from nothing. Because He is the Creator, He is greater than His creation. Because He is the Creator, He is absolutely supreme over all things. That means there is nothing in my life greater than God. And there's no problem I have he cannot solve. Nothing that baffles me baffles him. Nothing that stumps me stumps him. He is the unstumpable God. Number three. All things owe their existence to God, the Creator. This point follows from the previous two. Because God is the creator, he is the owner of all things. If I make a toy boat, I can truly say this is mine, I made it. I own it. Since God made us, he has the absolute right of ownership over us. At this point, we gain a crucial insight into why some people fight so bitterly against Genesis. Evolution for some people is just an excuse to reject God's sovereignty. People want to be free. We want to do our own thing, go our own way, live the way we want to. Do whatever we feel like doing, whenever we feel like doing it. And no one has the right to tell us what to do. But if God created us, He owns us. If He owns us, then we are accountable to Him for everything we say and do. That's not a happy thought for many people. Number four, true wisdom begins with Genesis 1-1. We say we believe the Bible. We must start where the Bible starts. Faith starts there with the very first verse. Wisdom 
and truth. And the search for God all began right here. If you want to end up where the Bible ends up, in the new heaven and the new earth of Revelation 22, then you'd better start where the Bible starts. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Let me put it another way. If you can believe Genesis 1-1, you won't have any problems with the rest of the Bible. If you can believe that there is a God who miraculously created everything in the universe, you won't struggle over the other miracles of the Bible. Why would you struggle over the resurrection of Christ? If you're willing to believe that God spoke and the stars sprang into place, in that sense we can fairly say that the Christian faith starts with the very first verse of the Bible. Here's the choice we face. Either we were directly created by God or we evolved over billions of years by the random acts of mindless, purposeless, materialistic evolution. Either we come from the hand of God, being made in His image, or we come from the mud through eons of mindless evolution. It's God or mud, and nothing in between. You are free to believe what you want. As for me and my family, we believe in God. Amen. The Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. If you don't believe in God, you are forced to say, nothing plus nothing equals something. To me, that takes more faith to believe than to believe in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Everything begins with God. Life begins with God. Truth begins with God. Understanding begins with God. Wisdom begins with God. That's why Genesis 1, 1 is the first verse of the Bible. This is where wisdom begins. Skip this and nothing else in the Bible will make sense. Skip this and you'll miss the central fact of the universe. Skip this and even though you have graduated from Harvard or Yale or some other Ivy League university, you'll spend your days nibbling around the edges of truth. You'll know the details of daily life, but you'll never understand it where you came from, why you are here, and where you are going when you die. It might be said that that sort of worldview that I've just presented is out of step with the majority view today. Mm -hmm. And I would tell you that's a correct observation. And I go a step further and say that the Christian is almost always out of step with the majority culture in one way or another because we embrace God's truth. Amen. Because we stand on the rock of Holy Scripture, we will always be out of step with those who have no time for God or have pushed Him into the corner. We propose a theocentric, that is a God-centered in all we say and do because we believe God must be the very center of life. In Him is life and apart from Him there is no life at all. Only barren, dreary existence. I think militant unbelievers understand this better than than we do. They know what is at stake in the battle over creation and evolution. It's nothing less than their entire way of life. 
That is why evolution to them is a religious point of view. And that's why they violently reject any attempts to challenge evolution or to present creation in the public schools. God must be kept out at all costs. They can't let him in because if you let God in, there's no telling what will happen next. If God is more than myth or legend, if God is more than a slogan on our money, if God is going to be God, then modern culture is in big trouble. We have so effectively marginalized God and removed Him from the marketplace of ideas that the very idea of taking God out of the picture, you have to explain everything without Him. But nothing makes sense without God. And that's why we're in a mess we're in. It was Christmas Eve, 1968. The three astronauts of Apollo 8 circled the dark side of the moon, headed for home. As their tiny capsule floated through space, they saw the glistening blue and, and white hues of Earth slowly fill their window. In that moment, what do you think those men did? They did not quote Einstein. They did not quote Shakespeare or Darwin, only one thing could capture the magnificence of the moment. Billions of people around the world heard the voice from outer space began to read. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The astronauts read Genesis 1. Verse 1, to a worldwide audience. That moment, no other words would do. I close with the words of John 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. That takes, takes us back before Genesis 1-1. Before creation there was God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the Word, that is Jesus Christ, became flesh and dwelt among us. That's what verse 14 says. Why did God create the world? Because He wanted to. We are here because God wanted us here. First there was eternal love. Then there was a vast purpose. Then a mighty creation. Then there was a great fall. Then there was a willing Savior. It's a very short distance from Genesis 1 verse 1 to John 3 16. The God who created he created you, also loves you. To paraphrase Job 12 that we read earlier today. The beast of the field say God, pardon me, let me rephrase that. The beast of the field say love made me. The birds of the air say love made me. The creatures that swim in the rivers and the sea say love made me. Only man, his back turned to the sun, does not say, love made me. When he turns to receive the light of Christ, then he too knows in his heart, love made me. And he cries out with every living creature, love made me. My Father in heaven loves me. It truly is a short distance. From Genesis 1 verse 1 to John 3 16. There are enormous moral issues that we face 
If we believe the first words of the Bible, if God created me, then he knows me. He sees me. He knows the truth about me. I cannot hide from him. I must someday answer to him. If we believe that God created us, then our heads should bow. Our knees should bend. Our wills should yield. Our hands should serve. Our minds should worship. Our hearts should love. God created us. God loved us. And He made it possible for us to spend eternity with Him. And so we join with Christians around the globe in proclaiming our belief in the very first verse of the Bible. We believe that God created us. That He made us. We did not make ourselves. That God created everything that exists merely by speaking words. That God is the center of everything. That God is supreme. And we therefore gladly bow before Him in worship, wonder, adoration, and praise. In Him we live and move and have our being. We owe Him everything. He alone is the Lord. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This is where the Christian faith begins. Hymn number 646. This is my Father's word. While Nathan is coming up to start playing, I want to, Don, is he here? Where is Don? He's up there. Oh, he's up there. Okay. Uh, I have, in this box, I have some books for the new year that some of you have ordered. After the service, see me. If you did not order and want some, See me also, I have some extras. And Carol, I have a set for you. Yes, the uh, church has donated a set for you as a new member so that you will have these wonderful morning and evening devotionals to look at. And we thank you. So see me after church. Hymn number 646.
Father, we're so thankful that this is your world. Amen. That you created all of us. Yes. And we are yours. And Father, we pray that each one of us will yield to your will and your way that we may enjoy the great pleasures of that relationship that you so desire is our prayer in Christ. Amen.